All right. This is a uh, call the Hyde Park Select Board meeting of Monday, January 18th. Here we are, dedicated working on holiday to order. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you're, we're going to have to we're gonna have to practice with that mute button too. So if you're not speaking, please use your mute button. Okay. Back to, you, back to you, Susan. Okay. I, uh, let's see. We'll, um, Ron, do we have other people on? Allison's here. Oh, Allison's here, right. And I, I don't see. Teresa Snow was supposed to be calling in, but I think she's logging in now. Okay. All right. We'll get her in a few minutes. Um, yep. Are there any changes to the agenda? No. Okay. All right. Allison, welcome. What can Hi. we do for you? Hello. I'm so What's glad to be here. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you again. Um, I am looking forward to tonight um, sharing with you our new um, community planning toolkit for uh, substance prevention in particular and I'm wondering if you all um, got a copy of it or if you if you've seen it at all there's a hard copy I tried to get to you yes this is what it looks like Um, maybe I can see a hand if anybody has one or who has seen it or seen a copy. No. Oh, no, I have it. Okay. No. Oh wait, you do you do have it or you don't have it? No, I got no's. Okay, so there are copies of this yeah. that are waiting for you, I believe, at the town offices. Uh, <laughs> and so let so then let me back up a little bit since you haven't seen it. Is there and also is there possibility for me to share my screen or sure? Yeah, if, you can, if you can figure out how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you might be able to so do it while, yourself. So while, can you do Ron, it? while Ron tries to figure that out. And hi Teresa, nice to see you in another setting. This conference is no this conference will now be recorded. Sorry. Okay. And now we're recording. Perfect. So anyway, I'm Allison Link from Healthy Lamoille Valley. We've seen each other before because of all the amazing work that you all have been doing over the years, especially around um, health and wellness in the community with adopting the, um, the healthy community policy. And um, so one second, um, Ron's trying to go to me needs to use accessibility features. Uh, Okay, I'll try to see if that'll work. If not, okay. Okay. And so with you, with you all doing the work that you've been doing, um, you know, adopting a healthy community policy, which is you're one of uh, two communities in Lamoille Valley who who've done that in the past few years, um, along with you know amazing assistance from Ron, and uh, really being. Um, Really, really kind of taking the lead in the Moyle Valley on what you've been doing. You are three, four, fifty partners as towns. Um, if you remember the three behaviors that lead to four chronic diseases that lead to more than fifty percent of deaths in Vermont, and being a partner three, four, fifty means that you signed on to a um, like a, a letter of commitment that the town will consider the three behaviors and uh, really work to um, decrease tobacco use and physical activity and to increase um, uh, healthy nutrition and all of that just really goes along with what I'm here to share with you guys tonight which um, is a document that we created and it is a community planning toolkit um, for preventing youth substance misuse and building protective factors. Now what is this uh, toolkit about? The, I'm doing an, a bit of an introduction tonight and really just like the overview and brainstorm a little bit about how we might use it. But just in the in the overview, you know, we all think about like, OK, well, what are we most concerned about, um, you know, for our town? And for some, it might be economic vibrancy. For some, it might be uh, resilience of the town or the health and wellness of the town, um, substance prevention in the town. Um, uh, Teresa might have her own of food security. And, you know, there there are so many things that that um, people might think about but really the policy work that we do 
um, relates to the economic viability and vibrancy and the health and wellness. Like the health and wellness piece really goes together. So this is a document that is building on a previous document that we created about how the policy um, uh, can support um, substance prevention. This one is specifically for uh, you know, youth substance prevention and what policies we can put in. But before we even do that, the document really kind of it can use it as a workbook in a way. It's like a, it, it's been um, adapted from the initial um, document that we created. So that's really user friendly. Now, let me explain a little bit. Healthy Lamile Valley and the. Get, Ron, do you have any idea why we're getting that, all that feedback? Uh, uh, let me I just check. I, yeah, some, I'm. Some people yeah, might it's probably, not be muted, It's I probably think. me, so I'm going to mute. Um, so folks with me, I just explain a little bit of like, we have this document, the primer for planning for prevention, which we did in conjunction with the Lamoille um, County Planning Commission years ago. And what a resource that is. I'm sure Ron has, you know, Ron's seen it. You all have seen it at some point, but, um, it really read almost like a dissertation. It, when I would go work with select boards or planning commissions, I'd go and I'd say, okay, let's go to play page 11 and look at some language you might consider in your town plan around health and wellness, or let's go look at some specific policies around that relate to substance prevention. And, um, and a lot of it was just not, we weren't getting at the core of what it was about. So this document is great because it kind of will take folks through. So for example, just give you a couple of examples. Um, we start out just sharing a bit of this piece, which is the Vermont prevention model, and just about how there are many ways of impacting substance prevention. Um, and people do it on all different levels from the individual level or between relationships and like what parents and families can do. But what Healthy Lamoille Valley does and what municipal planning can do is really on that like outer level of systems and policies. So that, you know, this is the beginning of the document. Then we share a little bit of data, um, local data and about risk factors and protective factors, like what are, is happening in the community that is leading towards um, increased uh, negative outcomes, but then also protective factors, like what do we build into our communities that help protect our youth from substance misuse? And so we have a piece related to that. We have some health equity. Um, and then we kind of talk about protective strategies, especially around having a community vision for health and wellness and really taking time to think about what is Hyde Park's community vision around. And a lot of that language, like you've already um, started to do in your healthy community policy and, um, you know, and, you will also notice that when you see this document, um, you will see a nice picture of Ron. Here he is. Can you see him holding some of the new signage um, that you all um, put in for the substance-free parks and trails and being 3450 partner. Um, so, you know, this really is a document that is highlighting what communities are doing like what you're already doing, but also looking towards more resources and what are other possibilities. Um, you know, how can um, how can you think more strategically, um, go back to that healthy community policy and even build on it and what more can be done. And so the toolkit is, um, we're, we've just launched this past fall, uh, it's an adaptation. It's already um, really spreading and people are finding it very accessible. So I look forward to you getting your hands on it. Um, there's a link to it from our website. Um, and that's, I don't know, can I share my screen or we're not sure about that at this point? Um, I'm not sure about that. I gave you presenter okay. rights. So, so if you go to healthylamoilevalley.com and maybe Ron can put this in the notes and I'm not sure actually how to, can I, can I chat it to everybody? Will that work? Um, Ron, Ron, Ron can put it in the, in the notes and then we'll have it. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll also, just in case you wanted to like 
click on it now. Um, I'll just put it, if folks know where the chat box is. Um, so I just put it in. So you can get access to it right from the link that I just put in the chat. And that will put a link to where you can even, um, you know, can print this or view it online. But also there are lots of other online resources, like, for example, um, all different health, your, your healthy community policy is there as a resource for others. Other community, um, other communities work uh, is all are is also listed there um, from vision statements to town plans to policies that folks have uh, adopted so what i wanted to do is just hear from you all like around substance use or misuse you know what might be some of your concerns um, currently and what do you think would be a way to potentially use this toolkit um, and to have you know hyde park um, continue to move your process around uh, have, uh, being a healthy community, you know, further develop. And, I, and I'm happy to have, you know, everyone chime in about it. Hi, Allison, it's Brian Shackett. And uh, could you just give us an example of some of the actual things that you've done with other communities, helping with creating the policy? Sure, you, you mean on the policy level? Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so Elmore, for example, um, has also created a healthy community policy. There are many towns that we have worked with on their parks and trails like you to have substance free parks. Um, there are uh, the town of Morristown had a wellness chapter as part of their town plan and we just helped update it uh, to be more inclusive to include substance misuse prevention and really a broader wider um, you know um, a breadth of definition of wellness and health so that includes mental health and substance prevention and other factors so it's involved in language in the town plan Included in Morristown's um, town plan update, um, which the Planning Commission approved, it still has to go through some other stages, but the Planning Commission also approved that they're going to have now a health and wellness committee that will be a subcommittee of the Recreation Committee to actually um, bring people together to start to really think about, um, you know, bring, bring a coalition together in the town to think about that vision statement, to work towards action items. And then second to that, they're going to have a substance prevention and um, I forget what it's called, but like a, a, a committee, a subcommittee that's focused on substance prevention and also recovery. And that that committee will specifically look related to substance prevention. Currently, we're doing some, you know, consultation and providing resources around Act 164, um, you know, looking at uh, all of the details and and all of what we still don't know and, um, you know, supporting towns and getting those resources to make, um, you know, strategic, thoughtful um, decisions and how to support towns in that. But other ideas of policy that, you know, you can find in the document, you know, some towns will look at, okay, well, um, you know, can we can we look at our outlet density? or like looking into the future of, uh, of outlets of that that sell substances. Can we look at our advertising? Like, do we want neon lights, for example? That's an issue going on right now. Like, can can we put in net neutral advertising um, ordinances uh, to be able to, um, you know, go beyond what exists and think about, um, you know, what the you know what we want our town to look like with respect to advertising and what's being or how it's being advertised uh can we look at um buffer zones of you know what kind of distance from our parks and from our schools do we want to have certain um you know businesses do we want to put in place checklists or you know extra um you know do we want to have more authority to kind of like when we're looking at reviewing a liquor license what do we want to be thinking about and how can we think about that uh these are all types of resources that we you know we support with policy pieces on that broader level does that help answer the question yes thank you sure allison i think um in many ways this is fortuitous because we have uh in the past couple of months, there are a, a couple of sets of parents that have been um, very frustrated because the elementary school doesn't really have much in the way of, you know, of, act, 
of activities. And, um, and so they've gotten together and there's, well, anyway, it, what's happening is I think truly a recreation committee is now truly being formed in Hyde Park. Wow. And uh, we have some wonderful ball fields that the current recreation has really been used for adult softball. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, and it's one of those, one of those great resources in town that most people don't even know it exists. Mm-hmm. So uh, these couple of sets of parents are really into baseball mm-hmm. and soccer and doing all that sort of thing. So I think mm-hmm. as they're, um, as they're getting themselves together, being yeah. able to make this link for them with, with you and, and yes, they're starting to have that is sort of perfect timing. That's a great idea. And I'll just add to it. You know, we have worked with some towns and I think you also have as one of your policies that there, you know, there's actually a substance um, limitation. I think there's no alcohol usage in Hyde Park um, facilities while there's a youth activity going on. Ron, is that correct? I, I think I read it. Yeah, it's it's for the prohibition for the youth and then uh, yeah. somewhat case by case for adult activities. For adult. Right. So like some of these, you know, and and getting extra signage and extra support. And there are two other um, projects that I'm working on that relate to this. There's this great initiative we have to work with youth sports coaches across all of the Lamoille Valley and help to support them in ways of not necessarily like the, um, you know, the skill development of like, you know, teaching the sports skills, but you know, how one adult, a, a child, a youth having one a caring adult in their life that's consistent is such a protective factor for them against so many negative outcomes. And so how a coach can be that person and we're doing, uh, we did a, fo- um, a big survey and focus groups and we have a work group now of a bunch of coaches from the Lamoille Valley working on supporting youth coaches across, which is great. And actually um, Jill LaRock from Hyde, uh, Hyde Park, uh, she won one of the, um, one one of the raffle prizes for doing the raffle and so Hyde Park Elementary for their basketball actually received one of these $100 um, gift certificates to power play from Healthy the Moyle Valley for that so that was great um, and what was the other piece uh, there so there are a lot of pieces of our work that you know are across different um, domains but from the youth work and being in the schools through the policy work and just um you know this document specifically is to kind of be something that anyone in the community could pick up but it's really how can the municipality really be um you know uh you know be those pioneers as you have been and how can you continue what you've been doing so it's a toolkit for that support for you um you know with whatever is coming up hey allison this is matt reed um i'm just wondering like Boca just added free uh wi-fi internet service in the village sorry i can't heal very well but i i'm trying oh, to can you speak I'm up a sorry. little bit better yeah i think so okay so Boca just added free internet kind of through their VTEL or whatever system in the village area. Yeah. And my concern was, is once they did that, I was wondering if the meetups to either sell or buy drugs or to use drugs was going to increase. Mm. And I've also spoken with the people in Elmore um, recently yeah. at the church, tried to get them to get a grant to put a cell tower in their church. Um, and I'd just be curious if, you know, they have the safe spaces in Elmore and all that, and it's working great now, but what happens when people can actually have cell phone service, meet up and sell and do drugs together in an area that normally they just wouldn't do it because they're currently all meeting in Morseville right now or Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, you know, we, I talked to Seth, um, Jensen about this. I don't know. I mean, I know that you have, you've had contact with him over the past and we talked about, um, back when the pandemic started about how, you know, internet is impacting, um, folks on in many ways, as we all know, and the lack of internet access. Um, but we also talked about even with the, um, how it related was people are are using more spaces and how, when those spaces are more accessible that, um, you know, people, you, people, we want people to use our public spaces, right, for many ways. And so how can we build in protective factors or policy along with um, enforcement, right, along with, um, you know, whatever newness comes and think about this. So I'm glad you're raising this lens because it, 
hasn't been one I've, I, to be honest, I haven't thought of much, but Steph and I did have a conversation about this and I'm happy to help, you know, pursue that and think about it. Um, you know, I think that the toolkit, you know, could be helpful, but I think looking at, as you see a risk factor or something as a concern, how do you build the protective factors around that, um, including these evidence-based, you know, policy, municipal policy level with, you know, enforcement to be thoughtful about whatever policy comes in. I'm not, I don't have a great answer, but I'll be happy to, you know, look up some of um, the research and ask some other coalitions if they've encountered that. I don't, I don't know the data, to mm -hmm. be honest on that. Well, certainly, I, certainly in any kind of planning of a park or an open space or anything yeah. where people can get to, um, that comes into play drastically on how, you know, we can uh, observe that area. I mean, it's changed the Oxbow and Morseville and how it's taken care of. The skate park in Johnson was almost, they almost had to get rid of it because of it. The mm -hmm. Talc Mine building in Johnson, because it's literally like playing whack-a-mole with these people. And if you don't enforce it either, on the other end of that, yeah, enforcement we don't what happened in Hannaford's and, and, you know, tractor supply with people OD and right in the store. Yeah. And uh, so, again, if there's no enforcement and there's no monitoring, yeah. I mean, yeah. they're going to move around. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have a lot more houses. When I was a kid, you could drive on a back road and pull over and find a place to drink for 30 people. Nowadays, there's 60 houses on the end of that back road. So, you know, they're having to move into these public areas. And again, it's not just drinking, it's meetups to exchange is the big yeah. thing that you just saw in Morseville, they pulled that yeah. people, three people well, over we, arm, you know? Yeah, well, we, you're right. We know that access and availability, you know, is one is a risk factor. We know that social norms, and like nor you know community norms around substance is that's a risk factor and all of that really leads to youth using at earlier ages which use leads to them being you know four to five times more likely to become dependent later in life um and cause you know and all the other associated negative outcomes on a um you know on an individual family and community level so we know that and so yeah i think that you know as obviously as you're considering um you know any any new option for you know not just wi-fi but other pieces that you know having that substance prevention lens or you know looking at and protective factors of what's going on you know is definitely valuable but i'll look into that i'm very curious what other towns have have come up with and what what they've seen and and Allison, I'm going to Matt that you're talking to is one of these parents has gotten real active and is getting the whole recreation yeah. thing going. So you guys awesome. have, have met talking that's this way, but would be good perfect. to get together because uh, that's uh, right. And, oh, that was I Matt did. Reed, Susan. I think Matt huh? Reed. Not, that was Matt Reed. That, oh, that was another Matt. Okay. Oh, yeah. I see Matt. <laughs> Sorry. Reed. Um, yeah. I know yeah. on the, the other things they used to do. Oh, go ahead. I don't know how successful it was in the in the 80s but they used to bring in people i mean we had a guy that was a former gang member come into the school and say all the horrible stuff that he went through and experienced and how it you know degraded his life and all the outcomes of it i mean back then there was always some white guy that came into the school and said whatever you know he's from new york city but we could probably bring somebody in that's Maybe if they, I understand they don't want to come from the community into a school. They want to come from a different community so they're not recognized as easy. But come in and say how it destroyed their life. And, you know, here we are talking about a lot of race stuff these days. Don't just bring in a white guy that just ruins life. Don't just yeah, bring in yeah. a black guy. Bring in, For you sure. know, whoever. Uh, yeah, health guy. equity is important. Racial justice is important. Yeah. Bring in a mother. Okay. okay. All right, you guys, I'm going to. I agree. Okay. Matt, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to have conversations with you, Matt, like um offline. Um I can I'll put my email in the chat when I'm when I'm done here. But I'm just curious. Um I know I don't want to take up much more time, but if right. um anyone from you know the the select board, you know, can think about uses in the planning commission and or the rec commission as you have, or even on your level of like taking um, you know, next steps as you think about Act 164, all different ways of like considering um, you know, the risk and protective factors and how we can support just uh you with resources, you know, please let us know. Allison, thank you for uh for putting that uh sending that uh, letter or that attorney um Dumont 
sending yeah. that about uh, 164, Act 164. I think that's a really good letter. And I yeah. think it's something that the town of Hyde Park really uh, would appreciate and do, do appreciate. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm glad that you got that. Jessica and I um, are doing, you know, we're all in the prevention world doing a lot of work just to be able to be, you know, help towns make educated decisions. And so, you know, I think the situation right now is that, you know, even the Vermont Growers Association, like, we just don't know a lot about what's going to happen with the Cannabis Control Board and what decisions they're going to make. And, um, and it's best to have all that information, you know, before actually making decisions and and towns also depends on how you read the law but some say that like once opting in then there's then that's it right like then there's no going back and you can't make any changes but if you could put together like a cannabis control committee beforehand then you actually are able to kind of think about well what are some other you know uh you know municipal additional um restrictions or or policies or ordinances what might we be considering like buffer to the school or other things that maybe we don't know what's going to come up um or in advertising so i think there's just a lot of unknown right now but we'll keep sending the resources as we create them and as we're on the teams across the state to to get it together and um, we love being a coalition so you know it's not about saying don't do this you know it's about saying okay like how do we help support like a, a prevention minded way of doing something if we're, if it's going to happen thank you and for all great. that you're thank doing thank you yep yeah great so Very nice important to see work. You. and Owen ron has also in the office the signs that susan and ron wound up yeah. picking these nice uh signs that you might see around at some events when uh i guess when when the snow's gone Right. Enjoy the winter and uh, yeah. let me know how I can. Uh, okay. Can Thanks, work. Allison. Thank you. Ron, what you have next? Teresa? Um, I can't identify one person. I don't know if that's Teresa as a caller. No. I guess not. No, I'm I'm in with video. You're in with video. Yeah, yeah. Do you see me? a wave? Hello. No, not yet. No, we don't <laughs> see you yet. Interesting. It that might be with my connection. Um, I don't have internet yet at my my home, my new home. So I'm using my phone hotspot. So I uh, see. I see myself. I uh, see you, Teresa. Oh, you have to, you have, Susan. What did you say before? Turn off the. Let's see. Yeah. If if. If you well, I don't know if you see it on your phone. If there's a little picture of you up in the right in the corner, and then it says "Share your webcam." Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's Mary Waltz. Okay. Mary sees me, and so does Allison. Um, okay. So okay. Well, we've got all kinds of interesting. Don't oh, know. <laughs> I think when I turned off my camera, it said T S S F. Do you see that in a circle? I see that. Couldn't see me at all. <laughs> no, nope. sorry. Oh, well, that's okay. We can hear. We can hear you, Teresa. That's great. And I'm curious if I can try to share my screen. And I, you can't see me. <laughs> you probably can't see my screen anyway. Oh, um, there you go. Okay. I, I just I just left the I just left my video off so she can come in. I think so. Well, there you okay. Have. Here you go, Teresa. <laughs> All right. All right. So thank you for for um, inviting me this evening. Um, my name is Teresa Snow. I'm the founder and the executive director at Salvation Farms, uh, and we are requesting first time support uh, from the town of Hyde Park. Uh, our allocation of town funding request is $750, and um, we have also asked that the um, signature waiver um, waivers uh, asked you to consider waiving the petition signatures um, related to uh, this this allocation request. A little bit about Salvation Farms work. Uh, specific to serving the Lamoille Valley in Lamoille County um, is our Lamoille Valley Gleaning Program. And for those of you that, that aren't familiar with what gleaning is, um, 
it's the act of reaping after the harvest. It's an ancient agrarian, biblically referenced activity. Uh, but in, in, in modern times, um, you know, previously was done by the poor. Um, but in modern times, it tends to be done by an, uh, an organizing entity like Salvation Farms uh, that builds relationships with farmers. We organize volunteers. We go to farms. We collect what they haven't picked or collect what they have picked, but they haven't sold. Uh, and then we oversee the logistics of delivering that food uh, to community-based food programs. Um, a little bit about 2000. Um, we serve 16 sites on a regular basis between Cambridge, Johnson, uh, I think one location in Hyde Park, and then um, a good many in Morrisville, uh, specifically for those that those agencies that might serve Hyde Park residents include Lamoille um, Union High School. Well, they um, had a, a campus kit, a campus food shelf, which we used to provide fresh produce uh, to. Uh, we started providing food to their for their home delivered meals. Um, we also provide food to Lairway Youth and Family Services, which I suspect um, serve youth uh, within your community. Uh, we also provide food to the Lamo Community Food Share and Meals on Wheels. Um, so th those, those organizations tend to have more reach into, into other towns. Again, the food that we're moving is uh, produced right here in the valley. It's grown by our local farmers. And there's a lot of reasons why um, this food exists. Uh, I won't necessarily get into that unless you, unless you ask. Um, but what we were able to distribute in 2020 uh, was around 70,000 pounds of Lamoille Valley grown surplus produce to these agencies. Um, we um, also served uh, residents of the Lamoille Valley through uh, a, a, a distribution program we call the Bounty Share. It's in partnership with the Community Health Services of Lamoille Valley, uh, where they identified patient families, and we would provide weekly uh, boxes of produce free of charge for um, those patient families. We estimate that we serve upwards of 4,000 households in the Lamoille Valley. Uh, this last year. Um, our program costs around $70,000 a year, and we provide this service to farms uh, and agencies at no cost. Um, in addition to our regular collection, you know, working with farms and volunteers and the distribution of those pounds that we collect from local farms, this year we moved um, almost 30,000, I think I have a number in, in what I want to screen share with you, but around 30,000 pounds of USDA farmers to families food boxes um, and uh, just over 1,400 gallons of surplus Vermont milk uh, right into our, into our community. And we're excited to share that the United Way of Lamoille County has been hard at work trying to get a building renovated in downtown Morrisville to house this program so that we um, can increase our service both to area farms uh, and the regions uh, food insecure. Um, total number of volunteers we engaged this, this last year was around just over I think 140 uh, who contributed uh, more than five, 500 hours uh, collecting food from farmers and distributing it around the community with us. So let me see. I can share this. Oh, I need to ask the organizer to make me a presenter if possible. Hey, Teresa. Yes. Dave Gaughan is speaking. I've got a couple questions. Uh, sure. Number one, number one, what other towns in Lamoille County is supporting this at their town meetings? That's a great and, question. So, oh. And, and number two, Aren't we taking away from local farmers and local producers that uh, are uh, selling their goods at, at uh, uh, the farmers market if we can they can wait and get it for nothing? That's a yeah, that's a great. Both of those are great, great questions. So uh, first, we've approached 
um, 10 towns. We decided to be really ambitious this year. Um, we have not received any funding from any towns previous to this approach. We've approached Greensboro, Craftsbury, Hardwick, Woodbury, Woodville, Stowe, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Cambridge. Um, it looks like we have um, a good chance in at least half of those towns, um, pending whether um, uh, whether some will waive the need for for signatures. Um, and I presented it, and so uh, both seem very positive. Uh, Crassberry has waived need for signatures. Woodbury was able to collect signatures for us as well as Greensboro. So, so, uh, so we're down to the wire with a few other towns. Regarding the terms and uh, the market impact. So I started, I started this organization and I was employed at a farm. It was really important to me that Salvation Farms figured out how we could respond to available surplus that we did so in a way that didn't negatively impact farms markets broadly. That's why we chose to focus on the charitable food system. Um, we, we measure uh, every year the impact that our program has on volunteers uh, to find out if any of those volunteers were introduced to new farms, if any of those volunteers are buying now from farms that they'd gleaned on, um, and whether they change any other behaviors related to food, like food waste, um, are they composting, that kind of stuff. And we've seen you know, more than 50% of responding volunteers indicate that they're changing dietary behaviors and purchasing behaviors as a, as a result of working with us. Um, we've also identified that through distributing this food, um, both the agencies, their workers and volunteers um, in addition to their clients are becoming much more comfortable um, with crops that are both familiar and unfamiliar, willing to take them home and try them. 15 years ago, um, you know, that was not the case. Uh, we had a lot of sites that were unwilling to take fresh produce because um, of the concern that people wouldn't be um, able to use the product or willing to or wanting to. So, a large part for us is educating people about local food, giving them opportunities to engage with local seasonally acclimated food products, because once you break down the comfort barrier, they're more likely to take the financial risk to make the purchase um, to support local farms. Um, one survey, one recipient said, um, it's really nice to know that farmers care enough about us to to make this food available to us. So, I, think you, I think you missed my question. My question was, how is this in, going to impact our residents that grow food to sell at the food markets, knowing that they can get it for nothing on, on your giveaway program, and when they're trying to sell this stuff and make a living? So my, my point being, I completely understood, because this is a question we get all of the time, is that, um, I mean, how do I say this? Well, being really Let me. Uh, well, a lot of the places the food's going, Dave, is not where farmers sell. And it's going to people who would not be buying this food. So, so, so and, and I know that Salvation Farms has always been very careful about um, one of their key things is to not be in competition with farmers. The end goal being that if, if ultimately, because mostly what, what farmers are going to be able to sell to restaurants and in markets are the A plus vegetables. So they produce lots of B and C vegetables that aren't pretty and people won't pay a premium price for. That's sort of where Salvation Farms is looking at coming in and long term being able to help the farmer find and develop a market for those fruits and vegetables long term. Because that's why a lot of it just it just stays in the field because the farmers can't sell it. You know, because right. people 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 want the broccoli to look perfect. And if it doesn't look perfect, they aren't willing to pay for it. How is that, Teresa? 
Dave, I've, I've also had the opportunity to work with Teresa over the years with the work crew, and uh, it, she, she pretty much works with nonprofits oh, I see. on a tight budget, yeah. is what I think is important for you to know. Um, and the, who goes to those nonprofits is what it is. Uh, I see. Yeah. Teresa, what's your, Teresa, what's your operating budget? Our, well, for our entire organization uh, for 2021 is uh, 550, $550,000. So we're just over a half a million dollar budget for our entire organization. But that includes national work that we do, statewide work that we do. Um, but for this particular program, it's just over 100000 And Okay, 100000 and how many, yeah. how many uh, employees, I know you have volunteers and you mentioned that. How many employees are you up to now? We have five full-time employees and we have one um, AmeriCorps VISTA member. Great. Let's see if I can move this down a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm also Dave, I was going to say oh. one of the things that I've always liked about these programs, particularly the gleaning, is it gives folks, and Brian, you know, having had your folks work with them, it gives folks that are, are receiving benefits the opportunity to go out and, if you will, pay it back, pay it forward, to be able to not just be on the receiving end. And um, that that has, uh, again, I would bet, Brian, you've seen it, some of your folks that have gone out and done some gleaning and that sort of stuff. Uh, working with food that way and being able to help other people has a has an impressive, positive impact on some folks. One one thing that I uh, I have always impressed and Teresa taught me about it was that uh, back in biblical times, as she mentioned, um, it was uh, practice to leave the, the first three, I think, or, or rows of uh, whatever you produce for the poor. And that's how the poor survived years ago, um, was to go to a farm and that first three rows of produce was uh, was for them to pick and have. I, I, I'm wondering, David, if this on the screen helps. Yeah, can us. you see the who we see? Yeah, he's got it. Um, and yeah, so I'm sorry that wasn't clear. Um, and it is only, we only provide direct to individuals when they're referred by their health care provider. And that number's small, a couple dozen in a year. Um, and they typically are referred to us because um, they have cr a chronic disease um, as, as well, or a chronic health issue. Um, coupled with um, f household food insecurity, so they're they we tend to serve um, agencies that serve individuals who um, don't have the financial means necessarily to, to to meet their needs, their food needs. Um, we had a great young man from I think it was a Larraway Youth and Family Services um, youth came out and picked winter squash a couple years ago with us and was like, oh, I don't eat vegetables, blah, 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 blah. And, and then at the end of the glean, he said, well, I can't wait to take this home so that we can put it on the barbecue. You know, so like the, like as, as Susan was saying, like this experience of people being involved um, starts to change their perspective of local food and farms. And um, we definitely don't want to compete with farmers. We want to build more educated eaters so that they'll support farmers. Um, I, I think that's if, if you've got it, Teresa, and we aren't, um, the reason we're having you do this is we're doing everything by Australian ballot. So you'll be a, a separate line on the Australian ballot for folks to, um, to support. Um, we're doing a couple of educational meetings um, before town meeting, but not as many communities this year we're opting. We won't literally have the town meeting, but there will be, um, people can as always request an absentee ballot or they can go to the town office and vote. Is there a way that I can make information available to them or is what we submitted already enough? Would something like this be helpful? Yeah, so the, there's going to be a couple opportunities for you to, again, uh, present some information at the two uh, informational meetings on February 22nd and March 1st, which has been our working dates to get the word out on all the ballots. Uh, front porch forum is good. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and it should be available on YouTube, so you can link 
uh, this meeting after as well to get more information out. Okay. I, I think your big your big uh, uh, place you ought to put this out is on front porch forum. You know, I, I, I think the, and it's just my opinion that the clientele that votes is also on front page forum. Mm. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, you get it out and let people know about it because I got a different opinion of it now than I did when I just read it. I hope that's a positive opinion. That is. Okay, good. <laughs> we have any more questions for Teresa? Cool. We good? Keep up the good work. <clears throat> thank you. And you all as well. And thank you for the, the time and, and your consideration. Okay. Ron, what we got next here? Okay, we have a quick update on highway. I think, I don't know if Mark's still here. He was tired from the weekend plowing and he was like, I don't know how much longer I can last tonight. And I said, well, we'll check in with you when you come up with highway reports. So I don't know if Mark's still here. I'm still here. Okay. Okay, okay. then let's, well, we should deal with Mark and we should probably deal with the hiring issue too while we have Mark. Come on, we're going to have so far yeah, as Brian, going, Brian can start cool. with that if he wants to. Okay, so <clears throat> we've done the interviews and um, um, Roland was part of them. Um, Dave was, uh, I thought, going to be part of it, but uh, it didn't happen. But uh, anyways, um, um, out of the, the three leading um, ones, um, Mr. Wells, um, Atherton and Travis. It's Brian, hang, on, hang on just a second. Um, Ron, do we need to go into executive session to do this? Uh, not not at this point. I think we okay. fine to announce their names quickly and then uh, Brian may have a recommendation. If he doesn't have a recommendation uh, with Roland being the two board members, then maybe you do, but if it's if it's not debatable, there should be a motion to have a higher letter. At some point, yes. I mean, if you if you want to talk benefits and a letter of hire and all those details, that probably would go into executive session. Okay, but we need to know what Mark thinks too, right? Yeah, so you can, yeah. You can ask. I ask, assume he's have, part of the process. Okay. <laughs> yeah, have Brian finish okay. and then. Okay. But at some Sorry, point, just yeah. Make, just want to make yeah. sure we weren't treading on delicate something or others here. Okay, no, sorry, Brian. Performance, performance stuff is the one you'd be careful of, yes. <clears throat> so we went through the interviews. Um, uh, we had really good applicants. Um, I think it boils down to skills and what we're looking for. We, we um, the application or the, uh, um, the, the hiring was for a greater operator. And uh, the one that I thought had the most skill out of everybody um, to run and an, an operate a grader would be um, Mr. Wells. Roland was part of it. If Roland wants to uh, give, if anybody's got any questions on, on the interview, they all, like I said, they all interviewed well. Um, very candid, very open, open honest. Um, any one of them would make a good uh, a good uh, employee, I believe. Um, they all show dedication to their uh, their current employer, and so I believe that uh, any one of them. But so that's why, for myself, it boiled down to what our needs are uh, currently, and uh, that's uh, that's what I'm. At. Yeah, Brian, uh, Roland. Before you say anything, I think Brian, can you say that? everybody's in agreement with your recommendation or should we go into executive session and talk about it i think we should go into executive session and we can talk yeah. about it because of the uh, particular like susan mentioned yeah so can we do that at the end of the meeting to let everybody well, online kind of get on to other things well how except we need to hang i want mark to be present for it so how long's 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, let me just check to see how many people we have. Yeah, and what they need. We could do other quick workarounds and then go in. Yeah, Mary, Mary Waltz and Matt Reed are here, and I th think that's it. And they're just keeping us honest? Yeah, well, I think they're here for the town assessor. Ah, okay. And Mary Waltz, I'm not sure. She might be just interested resident. <laughs> oh, she just dropped off, though. <laughs> I asked Matt, Matt Reed. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm just there you go. Are, are you here for the town assessor conversation? I am, but I can wait. It doesn't matter. I, I can, I you're sort of in. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, Mark, what you want to do? Have us go into executive session and take care of this, and then you can go get some sleep. Sure. <laughs> Are you already sleeping? <laughs> Half. Half. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then uh, I guess I need a motion to go into executive session. So moved. I guess. You got a second. Are you there, Roger? I guess. Okay. All right. We got Roger. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay, we'll do a hopefully a brief executive session here. Okay, we're now uh, the board is back in regular session out of executive session. And uh, Roley, do you have a motion for us? We do. Refer candidate. At to start the new hire at 2075, and we will put a six months trial on that. And who's okay. going to be the authorized uh, signer for the letter of hire? And that will be Brian Shackett. Right. Okay, we got the motion. Second. Okay. Any more questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Now, we sort of jumped around on that. What? Now, do we need an update from Mark on the rest of the stuff? Is he? Yeah, Mark is still here. Well, you're saving salt this year, aren't you, Mike? Well, put a big dent in it this last storm, along with the fuel. And the God, we haven't that. Oh, yeah. You know, we've had a lot of the little piddly storms, you know, but it's everything should be going a lot better as far as budget-wise than the last few years, for sure. Yeah, yeah, just hold, hold your breath. We usually pay. That's right. You got you get anything that you want to go over with, Mark? Any issues? Or? I don't believe so. I think everything is going as smooth as it can. Being down a guy, I think the guys are doing a great job trying to keep up with things. Oh, I, I, own, I got one thing, Mark. And it's very minor. I had to stop up to the town garage the other day. To, had to see Ryan. Nothing to do with the highway. It was doing the fire department. Had to see Ryan. And uh, all the doors were locked where I couldn't get in, which is not a problem this day and age with the COVID and stuff. You just don't want people walking in. But I do think that you should have uh, uh, the posters posted on the doors. Yeah, I got. We had them up, and they all got wet. I got to reprint them and get them back out. Okay, maybe we'll go down to the office. I have Kristen or uh, Kim give you one of those uh, plastic inserts. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And and I've got where to add Brock Carrier to the ready to assist list. 
Yes, I talked to Brock this morning, trying to get an idea if we could have some I did go wrong. And he offered to help because of our schedule wouldn't really affect his business because we're usually out earlier. So he was willing to give us a hand if we got the point. Hey, Mark, have you used, have you used Jimmy Parody at all this year? Nope, I've tried calling Jimmy multiple times to try to get him to set up, or ask him if the rate would work for him, and he has not answered me. So I don't know what's going on here. Okay. And, and the only thing that, that, that I got with uh, it, it's not with Brock, it, it's with anybody that's coming on to the town and plowing with their own vehicle is how much insurance do they carry? You know, if they should back up into somebody and run over somebody or or God forbid, kill somebody. A hundred thousand dollar policy ain't gonna go very far. Then, then it's gonna come back on the town. Am I right with yeah, that? Wrong? Yeah. Well, the insurance company will always say if you hire a contractor, make sure they have good insurance because once that runs out, it goes to the VLCT group. So in this case, I think. Um, Mr. Carrier is supposed to provide Allison with insurance coverage, and we do have minimum coverage limits in our policy, so I'll, I'll make sure that those minimums are met. Okay. I guess my question is, um, Mark, have you approached anybody from Hyde Park? Where's Brock live now? He lives in Johnson. Approached anybody from Hyde Park before this all closed up in our face? There's other contracts. Not really. I talked. Not really. I talked to Brock. I know he's already done all the paperwork to take care of the ball fields and stuff. I know he's already in the system for the town. Well, I think we ought to think about that and and um, consider some of these contractors of Hyde Park and ask him before, because I know a couple that will be. But if we asked them and then they said no, then that would be another ball game. But. I still think we should keep things to our contractors in our town. Well, why why don't you send Mark who they are and check with them, or or you and Mark figure out if you want to check with them and see if they're willing to do it and what the deal is, so that their you know, apples to apples are being offered or received from people. We can do that. Just a just a question: How long? I mean, when do you think it? Uh, the person we hire, how long will it take them to, to come on? We won't need them after that, will we? Uh, yeah, we're the reason we are looking, Brian, because is, of yeah, yeah, COVID and just you know, worst case scenario where we lost more than one or two people. Yeah, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to have two, two, two or three people on that list either, you know. What I mean, then you could go down the list just to. Just because uh, somebody comes down with COVID or something happens, that don't mean somebody's going to drop everything so, and doing their own business. So if what, that's the case, what would we, just, we just put a posting in the paper. There, or on front bunch of porch form, just or something. Yeah. There. And, and save Mark yeah. all the hassle and just get the people yeah. that are interested. Yeah, that's an idea. Yeah. Just like them to send us an hourly rate. What's that? Just give them to send us an hourly rate if they charge us by the hour. Oh, I, I'd have them bid it. Well, yeah, that's what he just said. Have them send an hourly, hourly rate. rate. Right. Yeah, you, usually if we send out an advertisement like that, we'll have a request that they submit the types of equipment, the number of people they'll dedicate to us as a priority, and their hourly rates. Yeah, and their insurance. Now, are we, are we also working with, uh, with uh, Morristown and Johnson for, for uh, backup? Well, we haven't had to use anybody, but we got good relations all the way around us. That, that's what I'm saying. That, that would be our, our uh, I, I would think that would be my first first choice is, is to call Morristown and say, listen, I got two guys out. Can you spare somebody? But the only problem is, uh, we're all about this, but if we're in the middle of an ice storm, a lot of times you can't spare somebody. They're, they're busy, Dave, believe me, if you've got a nice storm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so I think we've got the back, and again, this really is an emergency plan, and hopefully now, Brian, moving forward, we'll get our person hired. 
So then we'll we'll be where we need to be, and hopefully everybody will stay healthy. And the well, proper, thing is, the if, proper, you know, if we post this, that gets us out of a whole bunch of stuff. But if he needs Brock in the meantime, could he still use Brock in the meantime until we get this post? Just explain it to him what we're trying to do. You, you shouldn't have to with Jason coming on. No, this is true. Uh, no, you're, you're, <laughs> no, you're you're miss, you're missing the uh, you're missing the the mission here. This is a this is a, a triple backup plan. So you have right. your own crew. You have your own crew trying to manage it with less people. Then you have the neighboring towns that may or may not be able to help out. And then you have your backup crew of the contractor. So a lot and, of a lot would have to go wrong before we call Brock. Yeah, and and I think the most important thing here is the proper adaptation of using the proper ppe while they're working the yeah. proper precautions that they should be doing there yeah, so we don't lose a crew how are you doing with that up there mark in the, in the garage yeah they're doing good one they can remember say it again should we talk the other day about it now making sure their masks are on because in the beginning we were told that as long as they weren't within six feet and i just got told the other day as long as more than one person's in the garage okay but they yeah, didn't hear it the the yeah i think that's a good uh point to clarify we had um early early guidance that talked about the six foot if you're outside and trying to get separation on the inside and i think the state got a little bit more concerned about the multiple people in the same room without masks so i i i can't remember when it changed mark but the clarification was that it's really hard to keep your distance in the same space so it's, just it's a, it's, it's a matter of ventilation it's a matter of ventilation and how the germ can spread within a confined area. Yeah, very good. That's a good point. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Anything else with Mark, or can Mark Mark go take a nap? <laughs> um, I got one question for Mark, and then he then he can uh, resign himself to rest. Uh, we have a Lamoille County Planning Commission proposal to help the highway crew get trained on data collection and um, improving our ability to track expenses and report information to the state of Vermont. And we've talked to them primarily because they are the ones that assist us uh, on this on transportation uh, training items. And Mark's crew is somewhat capable, but to work with the state system in order to meet our MRGP requirements, we want, really wanted to get this done this year on both bridges and culverts. We have a we have a poor inventory of existing bridges, and we have no maintenance plan for bridges. We have you know fourteen hundred culverts and a maintenance plan to upgrade them, but some of the data from the two thousand and eleven inventory is not helping us plan better on how to apply the annual money. So anyway, that's the that's the mission on the ten thousand eight hundred dollar um, agreement that will be taken out of reserve funds to to get our both our bridges and culverts on a, on a good inventory, get the highway crew trained on how to keep new data in digitally versus the current way, which is paper, and also to help capital planning for future projects. So it's a multi multi purpose mission here with the with the regional planning staff. What, one little note, um, Ron, when it comes time for that training on the uh, bridges, I'd like to be part of that. Yeah, I think the uh, scope of work right now is to do a, I, I would call it a 70% 70, 70 inspection. Some of the things we can't let people do, which is get under a bridge, that's, that needs uh, the proper safety equipment, but a lot of other things can be done from the deck and from the uh, approaches. So we, we may need a, at some point a referral to an engineering company or a bridge inspection company, but this project will get about 70% of a good inventory.
Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. You got to write that backward. You're going to look right on camera. How's that one? There you go. <laughs> See, what, what, what I'm seeing is backwards. Yeah. Th th this yeah. one's backwards. That one, so, so I'll use this one now. Okay. I'm way ahead of you, Mark. I'm way ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a motion request to uh, enter into a, uh, an agreement with regional planning for 10,800 to help the highway crew get their digital skills up to up to par with the new state permit. So moved. Got a second? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. That's it. That's it for Mark. Okay. Night, Thanks, Mark. <laughs> good night. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Bye. Okay. The uh, the town assessor. Yeah, Ron. Just a, just a really quick thing on the uh, annual mileage certificate was up, which is also there. Um, that's due February 10th with the state of Vermont, so I'll need to get that submitted by February 10th. There's no mileage changes, so it's a pretty simple report. Uh, in the past, they've had all five select board members sign it, but I think with, with COVID, they've changed that a little bit. So if I, if I ask you to stop by the office to sign the mileage certificate, it'll be on the bulletin board waiting for you. Otherwise, they'll, otherwise they'll take one signature. I'm not sure which, but... That's all okay. I had on that one. Yeah, no, if you leave it out there, a couple of us can stop by and sign it. Um, on, okay. Town Assessor, the, now we got Matt uh, for this. Yeah, Town, town Assessor, uh, uh, we had a dry run on this situation two years ago when Julie Rowletter had her house for sale. And she was the workhorse on all things Town Lister. Back then, she was elected. And we tried to go through scenarios about what the town would do if we lost her and we ended up coming up with a contract for services with Nemrec to do basically Julie's job. And that didn't come, that didn't turn out the way Julie wanted, but we were able to keep her for two years. And now we are looking at potentially another round of her showing the house more and potentially at the same point we were two years ago. We also are in a situation where we have one vacancy on the board of listers and Gary Anderson is retiring from lister services. So we have two bit, two opens for town meeting day. If we go down to just Matt Reed, then the select board has to hire and put into contract a town assessor. Uh, professionally trained, I think is the statutory language, to perform those services. Uh, and again, that's usually going to be Nemrec. There are some private consultant firms that do this, but they're few and far between. Um, I think I got an email from Wolcott today that they're they're thinking about the same thing because of the um, situation with volunteers. You know, it used to be volunteers were able to handle all the state requirements for town listing, and that's gotten to the point where we we actually pay people a part time job to try to keep up with the state rules. Um, this. Uh, article, which is Article 6, I think, right now in the draft warning, uh, sort of forces the issue a little bit. So Julie hasn't left. We don't know if we're going to get a full board of listers at town meeting day. But there's nothing that's happened over the last two or three years that says it's going to get any better with finding listers that, uh, from the community that want to do all the statutory work. So this would be putting the article out there would, would tell the public that we have a situation where we need to change the way we do town assessing and the board is making that change now with going to a town assessor and the board of listers would be discontinued the select board would sign a contract for an assessor and Kristen who's already budgeted for lister assistant would be the contact person for that contractor uh, the contract we have with Nemrick drafted includes somebody at the town office being ready to help and do some filings and reporting that are required by state law 
Uh, so Kristen would have to be trained and brought up to speed pretty quickly to, to fulfill that. And that's probably in that budgeted range of three to five hours that we already have. So there wouldn't be a need to change money on the town office side. There would be a need to find about $10,000 to hire the Nemric consultant person. They're just a little more expensive than the employee part-time would be. Um, so that's using a share of some existing town resources, which are about $11,000 and adding 10,000 for the assessor. Now, we don't have 10,000 in the current draft of the budget to do that. If we had to make a change, then we'd have to find that, that difference between the contracted, new contract that you're, you're required to have and existing resources. So there would be an immediate gap. Or the other option is you amend the budget uh, by $5,000 tonight, which would provide that resource. We don't really know exactly what the contract will cost because it's early, but it would cut down on the $10,000 short. If the voters say no, and Julie's able to stay, that $5,000 could go to a big project that's probably about $60,000 which is to convert the digital, convert the paper records for zoning into digital. We did the land records and Kim's doing the, the bunch of it with a grant now for land records, but right now the only reason for people to go into the town office is to, is to get the zoning records. Every, there's no zoning records online right now. So right now that, you know, Kristen or somebody would have to go into the zoning file or somebody would have to make an appointment with Kim to go look at the zoning files while the office is closed. But even after the office is open, it, usually the paralegal or attorney look at the land records, then they look at the zoning records. Now, the only thing that they, don't, they wouldn't have access to right now um, when Kim is done with their project is the zoning record. So yes, it's a, it's a convenience thing for people um, and we could get started with $5,000. But if you need it for the town lister, then that zoning project would just get delayed until there's money for that project. So it's kind of a dual purpose, $5,000 to, to right. help hire a contractor and, and start, a, start a big project. It seems to me this is, Matt, if you're there, a good time to hear Matt's thoughts about this. And there we go. Um, so yeah, I was at, Thinking about this, and I understand that we're probably not going to get another lister. I mean, I, I understand the reality of that, especially during COVID. Um, and if we go to an assessor, I mean, I, and I thought about this, that Julie could contract out as an assessor. She can't be the town employee anymore than she has been. But she could contract out as an intern until she sells her house. She sells her house. Obviously, she's going to be busy moving and looking for a new place, so she would lose that. But it could cover us until we find a suitable contractor for that job. Um, but I, I understand the reality of it, and I just need to know when the cutoff date is to hand off the responsibilities. Is it at the town election day if no one comes in, or what's the the beginning date? Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing a little bit, Ron, is Julie, there is Kim going all the way back to the first book and getting stuff online because I end up in the 1820s a lot of times uh, doing deed research. Yeah, so uh, David, can you mute your mic? We're getting some feedback from your something or other. Thank you. Yeah, Matt, the, uh, the, the first, there's three phases to the land records. One is the initial one, which was done a few years ago, which got all the land records back to 2005 and now the second phase gets us back 40 years which would be um 1980. Um, the last phase is getting back to book one it's just it's a matter of money coming in from recording fees and time and money you know to keep picking off those years but there is a plan to gradually go backward okay i was just curious about that when you were talking about moving the five thousand dollars around you know how that would affect it anyway moving it back to the assessor well currently we there's a in our in our warning that we look at later we we 
put a warning is should the town move towards doing this um who knows what the town's going to say um I, I i think you're right depending on what happens with um you know with julie that could be a good in between i i know what they hope is they sell and they're gone but who knows um and i think sort of as ron was saying two years ago we were in the same position it looked as though they had it sold too um i don't i don't know everybody else what what do you what do you think we should do i i think we ought to go right back to square one we shouldn't even be talking about this right now because we got an issue in the listers department that i can't say right now unless we go into executive session and all you guys here on the board i'll know what i'm talking about it is uh i'll leave it right there if, if we need to talk about this we're going to go into executive session but we don't need to do anything with the listers department right now yeah i i, I think one of the issues dave is that the board of listers which is three people goes to one person they can no longer act as the board of listers and the select board is forced to hire a professionally trained town assessor that's how that's the uh, that's the only option under state law yeah and, and so, i agree with you but, the, but 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 there's a word in there wrong you use is if you, you can't run a business on it if. If, if if julie goes we may have to jump through hoops and get something but but no i'm talking about the i'm talking about the election at town meeting day because right right yeah, now it's we're the other to, two listers we don't have we have julie, two vacancies julie, and no one wants them yeah you julie's a town it? employee not a not a lister julie's a town employee now she quit the lister so matt reed is the only lister technically with gary resigning we're not going to have a board of listers on town meeting day and you're going to be forced to hire a professionally trained town assessor yes. by state law you're not going to have a choice the issue yes. you're talking about is the is the three to five hours a week no issue. it's eight hours i don't where i don't know where the three to five hours come up uh, it never uh, never was discussed three to five hours it was eight hours uh okay well let's let's say it's eight hours right now julie is doing all of the work that she does i don't think she's professionally trained but she's skilled so i don't know what the statutory you know hiccup would be there but she gets her work done in uh four to five hours a week and the the elected lister which is pretty much matt reed right now um i don't i don't think matt's spending any hours per week right matt it's just from time to time Right. I don't charge for when I review all the documents. I haven't charged for anything like that, which is minimal when Gary and I stop by and we sign the crime sheets. Um, you know, obviously the reason that we're not in there working, which we would have to get paid, is right now with COVID, I can't train for the second person in the office or whatever. And it's cheapest. The cheapest thing for the town at the current time is to hire Julie as she's doing it. She's the most efficient. I can probably do what she does. Even with a, a couple of weeks of training, it would take me probably 12 hours a week to do what she does in four to five. But I do review everything, like the grand list the other day and all that stuff, but I haven't been charging the town for any of that. I only really charge the town if I go out and I've taken pictures over the summer because I have access to properties that um, the normal um, appraisers can't get to. Um, I have gate combinations and stuff, so I've done that. But other than that, not being able to have two of us in the office is a challenge. So, so Dave, it's two separate issues. Are we not having the listers is the first issue, and is the issue that forces us to hire somebody? Okay, because there, there, you have to, you have to have three listers. We've got one. We have no other people interested in being listers. So for for with the state, we're out of compliance. And when you don't have your listers, you have to hire somebody to do it. Matt's saying that the 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 best thing for us right now is if we can hire Julie to do the work. But that that sort of postpones the issue of can we find three people that want to be listers, um, or do we hire somebody and and in that process, and as Matt says, the issue of you can't have 
not being able to get into the office and train is part of our problem with our five to eight hours that we're talking about over here as well. It's, it's the training time. If we, it's quite clear that if we go to, um, Julie sells, they, they sell their property and they leave, we hire an outside appraiser. That's really going to force the issue of us having the staff that does the five to eight hours that supports that outside appraiser. So that issue is going to be, will be forced that way. And I, I expect someplace out there is that the box we're going to be in. So I, I, I think my question is, do we, do we want to, <clears throat> do we want to put that issue on, on the town ballot? Um, <clears throat> do we want to see if we can come up with some listers? What do we, what do you think we should do, Ron? I think uh, Julie Rowletter uh, posted, I think it was Front Porch Forum or come out yesterday or uh, recently, she said she was going to post a plea to, to have interest in the listers position. Um, Matt can speak to this a little bit, but, you know, having the, ha having somebody with no experience try to catch up with state regulation and do the amount of work and training needed uh, just to meet the statutory requirements is quite a, quite a commitment. So we've been lucky enough to have one person for many years, which is Julie, filling a pretty big void in the sense that she was I mean, doing 90% of it by, her, by herself, even under the old uh, membership of the Board of Listers. So because there's not a wealth of three trained listers that can all help share the burden, which used to be the old way, you know, 20 years ago, uh, three people, two people, you know, they would they would be able to meet the statutory requirements, and that's not uh, as easy anymore. So we've, over the years, we've had less and less people uh, want to fill the elected position, which is forcing more and more towns on a statewide basis, really, to move to town assessor. So either, either you'll be forced to do it because, you know, worst case scenario, uh, Julie and nobody runs, so if Matt's a sole survivor and you have to go on a search for an assessor sort of after the fact, uh, what you can do, I mean, you can, you cannot make any decisions to add the article, know this is coming and to see what happens at town meeting day, or you can be more proactive and say, we've had a, a bunch of experience with all of these um, sort of the transition to, to a town assessor and, and we just see the writing on the wall and we, we need to ask voters for approval to make this change officially. So I think those are the two choices, either sit tight, know there's a lot of balls up in the air, see what actually happens at town meeting day, and then, um, or or make it proactive, have a discussion with the community and, and call the question. I think that's the way I, I would vote for, but you did, did somebody just say that Wolcott was thinking about going the same way? Uh, well, sorry, Westford. Westford, uh, when it comes to that, or if it comes to that, we can't find no listers. Maybe we can uh, work together with another town, and uh, if everybody else having that same issue, we'll have one person do three, four towns. Uh, yeah, that's hey, Johnson has an assessor because they had the same problem. I don't know how many years ago, but I can't think of her name that's down there. But they had to do the same thing. So Johnson's already done it. Um, and I will one thing I'll say is that software to get in there to understand that and know that every time they do a change literally you have to learn it again i mean it's almost takes a full-time job just to know the software every day i can't believe how complicated that is for to expect you know three volunteers or even someone paid employees to learn that is crazy to keep up on it and all the changes and all the trainings that go with it don't use it every day. So Dave, you think we should leave it on the agenda and 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 uh, for town meeting and see what happens? No, I think we should look look for three listers. Advertise for them. Well, Julie, we, Julie put something I had front porch forum yesterday. Yeah. yeah, I think Kim I think Kim is putting a notice out as well because it 
right now, because there's no decision, Dave, the lister positions will be advertised uh, as normal because there's two openings. And then the question of assessors forcing it a little bit, you know, it's forcing the issue based on the history that it's mm -hmm. the writings on the wall. Let's have a community discussion. So yeah, you can wait till something happens and make an action, you know, be forced to do it or have a discussion at these informational meetings coming up with the voters. Roger, what do you want us to do? Yeah. What's, there I go. thought you heard, oh, we voted we voted to put eight hours into the town lister. So what happens to those eight hours are supposed to go into the town lister? That 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 is a separate issue. She has to be up trained to do that work. The issue being, as Matt has said, with COVID, you can't you can't get people in to train together. So so that her hours are a separate issue. The issue right now is literally having the listers. Yeah, but I mean, the COVID's not going to last forever. I sure hope you're right. <laughs> so, and, and we've got, got this way so far for so many years. I can't see jumping through the gun and spending a lot of money for something we may not have to do. What would the uh, what would the uh, training look like if you had to do it, Matt? Well, I would say because we started the training. Uh, you have to do some online courses or, and you have to attend uh, at least a one or I think it's one or two full day classes a year. And I had kind of got up to speed on it <clears throat> and we had started to train Kristen when COVID happened. But it took I would say that train somebody that's a part timer that doesn't use that software, it would probably take working with a train lister or someone trained like Julie, it would probably take four hours a week for six months and you'd have to be the worst six months through the cycle of the grand list and all that to see every single step of that or let's say you worst case scenario you didn't have somebody you go to the classes which would be um i think it would probably take about five full days going to like st johnsbury or whenever they hold the classes around the state to get caught up to that if you don't have someone to train with and the worst part is, is when they change that software, like they did this year, if you don't do it every day, you know, you've got to go right, you're almost starting again. And the other thing is, of course, there's a lot of institutional knowledge. Julie, if we say something about McMahon's, you know, they got the discount there for their taxes for so many years. She knew that right off the top of her head, went and found the file, updated the thing, done in seconds. But if somebody goes in there that's a volunteer, that's a tough institutional knowledge to keep up with. Okay. I'd say that Roland, that the worst part is it's the software, not knowing, you know, it's it's easy to know what's going on in the town and assess places, but that software is a bear. And the state just keeps pushing out different software and it is a bear to keep up with. Okay, I just wanted to see the extent of it. I know that uh, the state is continuing with some of their training. They just uh, do it either online or you're just uh, socially distancing when you're when you're at the training site. The proper PPE. And and again, this is the training we're talking about for listers, not for Kristen. So we should have eight hours. So we should have eight hours of time that money to go towards hiring one then. Yeah, uh, yes, so we, you'd have to, right, right, Roger's right, you'd, you'd have to look at the current, come to an agreement on what the hours are, and then do a value on that, and either have Kristen fill in those hours with new job duties, take those job duties away and give them to a contracted assessor, or come up with a third plan. So there is money in the town office budget for listing services, not enough to pay for the whole contracted account with a new town assessor, but something to help there there is eleven thousand in the current budget for a nemeric contract to help with listing and there's that's five thousand 
And then there's 6,000 for lister salaries, which are really for Julie and uh, any of the town listers, elected listers. So there's 11 in the budget. There's some in the town office salary side. And the combination of that, all that might leave probably less than 5,000 difference, maybe, or, or maybe cover the whole thing if you had to go contract out. So, so that's why I didn't use 10,000 in my earlier explanation. I, I think 5,000 more in the budget would pay for a totally contracted person. Dave, Dave's proposal, Dave's proposal is to not to add anything to the budget, see what happens at town meeting day, and then you'll have decisions to make based on what happens, which is, which is fine. You won't have the $5,000 in the budget. As I think, I think Dave sort of, we, we got so many things that we don't know that I think going through town meeting, which after town meeting we will know, we should have a much clearer picture. Who knows? In between, Julie may sell, they may sell their house and be gone. There are just so many variables right now that, uh, so would, do we leave that as an item in the, for people to vote on? Well, if you're, yeah, if you're going that way, you would take out the draft article. Right. Um, you could mention it in the informational meetings that this thing's out there so people aren't surprised yeah, next year happen. if it comes yeah. up. Yeah, that's about, that's what you would do if you, if you took it out. Okay. There, the budget doesn't have to change because we never put any more money in it. Does that work for everybody? I like that idea. Put it to the voter. No, this is actually, we pull the article and we can talk to them at the informational meetings because we don't know what's going to happen. And then once we see what happens, we can say, okay, here's, here's, what's, here's what's going on. Yeah, that. Okay. Got it, Ron? That worked for you, Roger? Yep. Ron yes, we're all, we're all good. Yep. Okay. You. Thanks, Matt. Okay, zoning fees. Okay, so I sent out it. I reviewed the current zoning fees against four or five other neighboring towns that have zoning regulations and and come into more of a market adjustment. Uh, they're not higher than everybody else. You can see that there's some towns higher. There's one, I think one town lower than what we charge per square foot. Um, I'm looking at it as a true up, you know, uh, you know, re refreshment of the fees, um, and let and then let it sit for another, you know, six or ten years or whatever before visiting them again. I'm going. I'm I'm searching through paper looking for it because I remember when I looked at it, it wasn't. There wasn't any gigantic change in anything. It's just bringing them all up a little bit. You, you're talking about permit fees, Ron? Yes. The, uh, yeah, what, yes. What, 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 what would it cost a person right now to go in and get a permit to build a house? Uh, depends on their size of the building, but they're generally they're in the 150 range, maybe, something like that. So for 1500 square foot yeah it would be 150. yeah then uh then uh th th then you also have uh we're only we're only talking building right we're not talking all permits together uh, we're talking yeah we're talking two two different types of permits one is the development or zoning fees the other one is the 1111 permit for highway access and that is how much uh right now it is 90. Okay, and what are you proposing? Uh, same fee, but um, putting, hold on a second, I'm trying to pull up my, I have a list of all these things, of course. So the, yeah, so the 11.11 fee currently is 90, and it would go up by 75. So it'd be 65, 165. 
uh, the hundred and sorry, seventy five dollars of that, which is your increase, goes to the stormwater reserve fund to help with our MRGP compliance. And that's your roadside ditching and dealing with the stormwater that comes from the driveways. So we have new requirements to deal with that stormwater in a little more expensive way. So as people develop their, as they, they develop our drainage system with driveways or roads, we have a fee that would go into stormwater reserve and be used for future projects. Okay, and how much on the 150 for 1,500 square foot that would go to what? Yeah, so that, that's a flat fee for every house. So if somebody comes in and says, I want to put a house on some road, they'll pay a hundred and they'll pay the hundred and sixty-five for the highway access permit. Mm -hmm. Seventy-five of that goes to the reserve fund for future town projects. Okay. The first seventy-five goes to the administration of that permit. Uh fifteen dollars goes to the recording fee because they go into land records. So it's really a hundred and fifty plus fifteen on a then what's the other 150 for the house? Yeah, so on a fifth, the other yeah, one. so right. So on the we can just use let's use a thousand square foot house. You're gonna have sixty-five dollars for the house permit. It's a small house. <laughs> and under the proposed uh it'd be 115. But you're at 150 now. No, no, this I'm talking about the zoning permit. The, the, the zone, there's two fees we're talking about. The highway access permit, which is the driveway, right, goes from 90, which is 75 plus 15, because we're right. at the fifth. And then the new fee for the driveway is 165. But but you said a 1500 square foot house would be 150 dollars. Uh, no, I think Brian said I'm I'm going to a thousand square foot house to compare current plus proposed. Okay, a thousand. So current, yeah, the current right. house for a thousand square feet is sixty-five. Okay. The new fee would be one hundred and fifteen. And all the increase for the driveway goes to the stormwater reserve. Okay. That's that's not an increase for administration. That's an increase for stormwater reserve to for future projects. All right. And the, the formula is five cents to 10 cents a square foot. So you, you can pick any size house you want and get the, yeah. get the fee. Uh, the other big change was commercial, which is 10 cents to 20 cents. And, and this would put us like our neighbors, correct? Yeah, they're all, they're all coming in line with the neighbors. You can look at the list and Stowe has some variable they have, they have rates all over the place. 20 cents is their highest commercial, which we would match. Uh, Underhill is a 50 cent commercial fee, which is wicked high. I don't know how they get away with that. That's pretty high. Uh, Hardwick has a flat fee for a greater, greater than $7,500 of value is $65. They have a different system. They, they assess on value of construction. But, but, but commercial is going to stay the same if somebody built a thousand square foot commercial building it cost them two hundred dollars for the permit for a thousand square foot building yeah okay. yeah and that's also the minimum fee so if they built a a small something less than a thousand square feet it would still be 200 200 is the minimum right but if it was uh, one thousand three hundred and fifty square foot it'd be a little bit more than ten dollars or something like yeah that. a little bit more than 200 yeah yeah okay um, one of the one of the things that uh i what was finding is that the subdivision process which is there's a section on subdivision fees tends tends to be about the same whether it's residential or commercial the, the standards aren't that much different but for some reason we had a difference you know, the a single residential subdivision lot was 50, but if you did commercial subdivision, it was 100. But I'm finding I spend about the same amount of time and effort, no matter what type of use, because they all have to deal with the same kind of regulation, storm water, driveway, whatever. So under the proposed, it's a it's a hundred dollars for residential and 150 for commercial. 
So they're slightly increased, but under the current fee, commercial plays double residential. Under the proposed fee, it's uh, 50% more. And on the regular one, 100% of that goes to the town. Yeah, all the all the residential fees and driveway fees, except for that 105th, uh, sorry, except yeah. for the 75 for stormwater reserve. Goes would to go the town. To, yeah, go to town. Anybody got any questions? <clears throat> okay, so is that Roger? No, I'm all set. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess we need a uh, a motion to adjust the fees. Yeah, you have you have two options on that. You have two options on that in your motion. Uh, I need an effective date. You can have those effective February 1st or July 1st. I like July 1st because the, the, the rates going up it gives people a chance to get through the building season this year and also to hear about the rates going up so they might want to get their applications in before July 1st if they're concerned about that kind of a dollar amount. Yeah. So moved. So moved. Second. Right, with the July 1st. So July 1st. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, we got the increase in the fees going in July 1st. Everybody in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Phew. Okay, Ron. Little the odds and ends of the town of the town budget. Yeah, I'm not I sent the budget out that was dated for January 18th, posted it on the town website. It only had those changes that we discussed the last time, so there's no no new major changes. Um, I think the next thing to do is to finish up the town warning, finish up the town budget, the tax rate projection, and start to publish it and get people interested in those informational meetings. Um, like I said, it'll, it'll stay on the town website homepage so anybody can see the budget. But I think that either the select board can write something to Front Porch Forum, I could write something to Front Porch Forum. But just to start putting the information out there because it, it is harder to, to, if you're not looking, it's harder to get people the information so it's more more responsibility of the select board to get the information to people and i think like dave said front porch forum is good for that uh kim's kim and julie are doing their things on the election that we talked about earlier but we'll also have to put more information out on the two meetings so on the february 20 they're mondays now just for clarity monday the 22nd of February, Monday, the 1st of March, will be those informational meetings. And we have to advertise those in the beginning of February. So there are there are formal hearings of the select board and we'll, we'll treat them as such. And hopefully people can log in and participate. But there's gonna be a lot of people that just wanna know. <laughs> they wanna know the information and then, then decide. They're, they're not gonna to wanna to know a meeting date's coming up and not know a little bit about what it's about so uh, how do you want to approach that this is kind of your choice each member could write something up and put it on front porch forum to get interest uh susan and i can do that um but anyway it's going to happen over the next couple of weeks I, I yeah, I think just one, I mean, one letter from in behalf of all the board would do just as well as everybody writing on their own thesis on it. Well, uh, and I think it's just as much we can, we can, what this is really to do is to let people know where they can get the information. And that's, I think, you know, and I think the page that people really look at, Ron, is that is that first page on the budget you give us you know here's the whole here what it is and people go right to their tax rate 
So, you know, here's what it's going to cost, um, you know, going up. Oh, the, yeah, the hundred, the hundred thousand dollar number. How much yeah. per hundred thousand? Yeah. 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 Why? Why? Why don't we? Um, maybe I'll work with Ron, and we'll do a couple of of uh, little short things that we can put into Front Porch Forum um, to tell people to to get people that they can go and look and put put a real easy summary that people can click on and get to very easily, Ron. Um, yeah, I think the I've been using the uh, home page of the town website for those kind of things because it yeah. doesn't re doesn't require anybody to get deep into the website. They can have it read as right. the first page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and we might have a quick little chat with Roland LaJoy and and because um, I think a a lot of towns are going to be and people are going to be scratching their heads about how they get information and how you do things this year. Um, since everybody's going to this, this sort of a system for this year. Um, how about, right? you and I will draft up a little something. We can just email it around to everybody and they can see what it what it is and we'll just start putting it on Front Porch Forum. I, I yeah. also put in News and Citizen. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yep. Some people may not have a, uh, utilize that forum. No, you're right. Just just draft up a little thing and put it in front in uh you're right, the news and citizen and say, Hey, if you need information and here's where our, our informational meetings will be and go to the town website and get the information you want. Or call in. Call call Ron. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think the um I think that's a good approach. I think, you know, like I said, people people will be mostly informed because Kim is putting things out there. A lot of other towns are talking about it. But still, if, if we can get something that's short and sweet and just lets people know that um, the information is totally available um, and do a little bit more this year, I think people appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Um, with just those changes in the budget, we probably need to accept the budget, right? Yeah, I think there's um, the mechanics of this is um, I think there's probably a special meeting, quick, you know, quick morning type meeting or another type six o'clock meeting. And what I mean by that is like, I'd rather have the board have in front of them the warning that's final, the budget that's final, the tax rate that's final, and then I'll call, a, I'll work with Susan to call a meeting so I can get all this final stuff. We don't have a final warning right now. I'm still working on that with the town attorney. Uh, the budget, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm done with the budget, but there's no harm in looking at it one more time. And then when I have everything together, it'll be, you know, please vote to uh, approve these. Uh, which would be the warning in the budget and it won't be that long like the de the deadline uh, for the for the printer which is the deadline i usually use is february 1st and then shortly after that kim has her election deadline um deadlines that come up so probably within maybe it'll be next monday maybe it'll be you know end of this week but i'll give i'll give it to you at least a day ahead there won't be many changes but you'll have final documents to vote on Okay. Um, and just everybody, if if you haven't, um, it's it's in the packet, but it's the the um, the beginning of the of the town report and the report from the select board. And if you haven't read it, if you'll look particularly, I Ron and I worked and put in some stuff about the the village water system and the increase and that whole thing and explaining it, giving people facts about what's going on and the background in it so that folks will, uh, will know what's going on. So if you all get a chance to look at that and if you have any changes or figure out a better way to talk about it, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I'll, I'll include that with the final set of documents. So you have the final select board report just so I can bind it all together and you have it one place. 
Okay. Um, what else we got? Oh, the tech group contract. Right. That's a, that's a simple vote to extend the current contract through June 30th. Uh, the changes that we talked about earlier are phased in uh, July 1st, 2021 and July 1st, 2022. So this is really just continuing their services for six more months because that contract expired December 31st. Okay. I'll move. Second. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Okay. The town, take a minute to look at the town orders. We, we were going to see if we could get those like on Friday, right, Ron? Ron, Ron you're muted. Yes, that was a that was a <laughs> delay. We, we I'm trying to transition some of the work that I was doing on my computer to Allison. Okay. And, I, and part of it has to do with bundling of all those invoices on a digital okay. Adobe, and we're just it, for some reason the credit card didn't go through the first time, and it just it bled into the end of the week where where she got pushed okay, okay. In, into the weekend. So. Once okay. she's set up with her software that she needs, she'll be able to do most of the bundling on her end and get it the way she wants. Right now, she sends me multiple files that I need to bundle, and it's a, it's a little cumbersome. So, sorry about the sorry about the delay. We can you can actually take that report if you. Well, I don't know because I didn't talk to Allison if there's anything time sensitive. But if you want to take time, we could always take some time if somebody's not comfortable with the late delivery today. Or you can take a few minutes here and, and take the time now if you want. I get I I got through them fine. I just no, I, just, I just I understand. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Okay, that's all right. Everybody else get through them. Need some time. What's your pleasure? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Then I guess we need a motion to approve them. So move. Second. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody aye. opposed? Okay, we're good. Um, review of the minutes. There it is. Here. There it is. Ah, come on. Um, have folks read them? What's this? Yep. Anybody find any corrections? Find the main. They look good to me. Okay. Need a motion? So moved. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of accepting the minutes, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. I, uh, let me see. Um, for an update on the village water and, and uh, sewer, I talked with the, uh, I talked with Joel Page. And then, um, We've officially we haven't 
we should get it sometime this week. We're getting a uh, a contract with the law firm. Um, they've looked around the state and are hiring a couple of, of, of Vermont folks that have experience with rate setting and working with municipalities on this sort of thing to um, be able to take all the all the information that the village has done and come up with uh, trying to understand and questions about how they reached the system and the rate structure that they did. So it's just, we'll, ju we'll just keep plodding along. Look, you left out one thing, Susan. Yeah. It's pro bono. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. No, it's not pro bono. We're, uh, we're uh, splitting the cost. The con we haven't gotten from the um, um, from the lawyer yet. The uh, the the uh, the charges, um, and I think they're getting because they just with the bid for the um, for the uh, for the rate consultants, the Vermont rate consultants. We'll we'll see what it looks like. And we're now um, when uh, when Allie does makes the make payments, um, we do it. Um, you know that it's in protest, and when you see that the draft of what I've uh, I've done to explain to people um, what it is and why we're doing it and the amounts of money that we're talking about. And I guess anybody have anything else? Yeah, yep, yeah, I do so. Yep. Uh, talking about the town report, who are we going to dedicate it to this year? Yeah, anybody got any ideas? The um, the only one I could remember, I looked, I did look through some obituaries for Hyde Park trying to match any names I knew to somebody that had done town service. Um, Melvin Harvey has the longest uh, yeah. membership yeah. on DRB. And I yeah. didn't recognize any other names like that would have been serving in the last <laughs> 10 years or so. So I don't, if somebody was there, I didn't recognize their name, but anyway. So no, I think, I think that would be very appropriate. Now, if you want me to, I, I, I will uh, work with Ken to get a picture and a, and a small write-up if you want that'd be great that would be it, terrific it, and when do you want that invite on um dave let me i'll email you what i found on the um my web search okay and you can you can look at that and talk to ken okay um i'll i think we're asking for all reports from everybody in the world that wants to be published to be here by next um by friday i think by friday or monday at the latest okay so for you, it could be Monday at the latest next week. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> but I'll, I'll send that I'll immediately, like in a second or two, I'll send you what I got. It's pretty good to what they wrote up in one of the obituaries. So yeah, but I'll, I'll get a picture from Ken or. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you what I have and ask ask Ken to, for some fun, some funny remembrance or something would be good. Yeah. 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 Good. yeah. Okay. All right. I'll do it. Okay. Anybody got anything else? Guess we're in pretty good shape. Anybody online, Sue? I don't know if anybody's oh. still here that had comments. Right. I forget. I Mary and Matt Reed are still here. Don't hear anything. Okay. I guess. Motion to adjourn. Okay. So just a second. So move. Terrific. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We set? Aye. Everybody stay healthy. You particularly, yeah. Brian. Be careful yeah. over there. Jeez. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Stay healthy. Uh, Good night, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.